Well, good morning, Lakeside. Are we ready for this morning? Awesome. That is so good. I am so thankful to be back up here again and so thankful uh, to be not only worshiping with you, but learning from God's Word alongside you. God's Word um, has the power to transform our hearts, transform our lives. And I fully believe that. It's, it's not my words that are going to change any of us. It's God's word that's going to do that today. And I fully have confidence that he is going to use this morning for our good and for his glory. Now, how he is going to do that, I don't yet know. Um, so you're, uh, you're with me on this, and I, I'm excited to see what God is going to do, uh, even though we don't know every single detail. Uh, sheets were hopefully handed out to you that look like this. On one side, it has chapter 3 of Ephesians. And um, I'm going to play a brief video of, uh, of Beth Moore reading Ephesians chapter 3. And if you want to follow along, uh, the sheet is available t- for you to follow along. If you want to just listen uh, to these powerful, powerful words Um, You you can even close your eyes and listen. So whatever is comfortable for you, um, I'm I'm hoping that as we hear God's word, it begins to soak in to our very beings and affect not just Sunday morning, but our everyday life. So let's listen to this brief video. For this reason, I, Paul a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power to me. Though I am the very least of all the saints, This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. In this passage, in verse 6, there is this word. It says that there is a mystery. And my first question when I looked at this passage is, what 
is this mystery? What is this mystery that has been hidden for ages and is now being revealed to the church? And when I was a child, I loved TV shows and especially shows that had a bit of mystery involved in them. I loved MacGyver and MacGyver was one of those guys that it was always a mystery. How is he going to get out of this pickle that he's in? How is he going to escape a room that he's locked in? And he would always um, come up with some creative way to get out of whatever predicament he was in. He would solve his own mysteries. Our issue as people is we can't solve our own problems. But the mystery that God reveals in this passage through Paul comes in verse 6. It says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. It used to be in the Old Testament that the Jews, the Israelites, were God's people, and people that were not Jewish were not. There was kind of a cut and dry system. And Paul was a Jew of all Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader of his day. And he could have very well said, you know, I'm on the inside crowd. You Gentiles are on the outside. But God revealed to Paul that Paul should go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That everyone has access to the grace-filled gospel of Jesus Christ. That it is not just for the Jewish people, but it is also for the, for the Gentiles. Now we need to remember that Paul, a, a few years before this was written, uh, spent about three years in Ephesus planting this church that he is now writing a letter to. And as he writes this letter, he is reiterating this fact that the gospel of Jesus Christ gives a level playing field and access to the grace of God to all who believe. It's not just to the Gentiles, or just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles also. These four points, I think, are so very important for us to understand The gospel of Jesus Christ is available to the Gentiles. They are fellow heirs. Gentiles are going to inherit exactly the same thing as the Jewish Jewish followers of Jesus Christ. There is no difference. They are are, uh, members of the same body. As we're a church family, sometimes the Gentiles were seen as outsiders, not invited into the family. And Paul wants to make it abundantly clear that they are members of the same body, members of the same family, that they are also partakers of the promise. And this promise was signed and sealed between God and Abraham. In the Old Testament, there was a promise of a coming Messiah. It was called the Abrahamic Covenant in the Old Testament, And it was God making a covenant with Abraham that I am going to provide you a Savior. And that Savior is Christ the Lord. And so now these Gentiles can also partake in this promise. It's not just for the Jewish people, but it is for the Gentiles as well. And they have the access, they have the right to be recipients of the same gospel. This is great news. If you've ever felt on the outside, um, you understand what, it, what these Gentiles felt like. They, they were on the outside. Now, this past week, I was a substitute teacher at a middle school. And when you encounter middle school life, almost every single kid that I talk to feels like they're the one on the outside. If I went to the most popular kid in school, they would still feel like they're on the outside of some group. And as I talk one-on-one with students and hear their story, most of them come up with this idea that I am not accepted. People don't like me. I'm not cool. I'm not lovable. I'm not one worthy of being accepted into the group of cool kids. 
And even the coolest kid of all, you know, uh, the coolest kid on all of campus still feels that same way. This junior high mentality of not feeling like you belong really makes them um, almost depressed at times, very, very sad. And I think all of us can understand what it means like what it means to not be accepted by a group of people. So this good news that the gospel is now available to the Gentiles is something Paul wants to shout from the mountaintops. He wants to clearly tell the church that every single person you will ever meet is in need of the gospel and no one is beyond the need or no one is beyond what the gospel can fulfill in their lives. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is available to every single person you and I will ever meet as well. No one is ever too far gone. No one is ever on the outside. We can invite them in to the family so that they can be fellow heirs. They can be members of the same body. They can be partakers of the promise and they can be recipients of the gospel. Think in your mind right now of that person that you go, wow, they sin so much. They are so far gone. God could never love them. Even that person, God dearly loves them. He created them in his image and likeness, and he wants to have relationship with them. So no one is ever too far gone for the gospel. And that's good news. Secondly, uh, Paul became a minister of the gospel. Now, in this passage, he talks about how he is the very least, and he's going, it is only by God's grace that I've become a minister of the gospel. It's nothing that I have done. Now, if there's anyone that could have boasted about their being very, very religious, it was Paul. And Paul said, you know what? Honestly, all that religious work, it's all garbage. And I want to seek Christ. I want to seek his affection. And he said, you know what? As I started to seek Christ, as I was transformed on the road to Damascus, my heart was changed. And not only am I saved, I get to be a minister of the gospel. I think Paul is baffled because Paul is going, you know what? I was such a horrible Sinner, I was persecuting Christians. I was persecuting the church. Why would God choose me to be a minister of the gospel? And I can imagine for Paul that there were moments that his past would catch up with him. And he would go, you know, what kind of a guy am I? I used to persecute Christians and now I get to preach the gospel but that past had to haunt him at day, on, on days where he started believing lies that he is who he once was. He isn't who he once was. He is a new creation in Christ. And he is able now, under his new identity, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in this passage that he was appointed by God's grace to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you are a person that maybe labels yourself as, you know, as a bad person and a person that is unworthy of being a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, take heart. Paul was in that same boat and he was one of the most effective disciple makers and church planters in the early church. We know of at least 14 churches that he helped plant um, and countless disciples that he walked alongside. He also wants wants the Ephesian church to understand that he was enabled or empowered by God's power. This wasn't his own doing, but Paul was given this ministry of reaching the Gentiles with the gospel, and he was empowered with the Holy Spirit the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is alive in us as followers of Jesus. So as we go and become ministers of the gospel, disciple makers of this community, we don't go alone. We go by the grace of, or 
we go appointed by the grace of God and enabled by the power of God. We can't change people, but God can. And he chooses to use us. It, it still baffles me that he uses us to go reach other people. But that is what he has chosen to do. Paul also responded to his call. God called him by his grace to be a minister of the gospel. God gave him the power to carry this out. And Paul could have just sat there and done nothing. He could have said, okay, God, I understand your grace for me. God, I understand your power at work at me. Paul could have stopped right there. And I think sometimes as followers of Jesus, we do that. We receive God's grace and we receive his power and love in our lives and he's transforming our lives. But we don't activate into being a disciple maker. And in this passage, we see that Paul responds to his calling. And he responded in four distinctly different ways. Paul Preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So God may be calling some of us in this room today to actually verbally proclaim the good news, proclaim the gospel, preach the gospel uh, to our families, to our friends, to our neighbors, uh, to anyone who will listen to this good news that is the gospel. Paul also taught God's plan to the church. He wanted the church to be well-educated and well-understood as to what God's plan is for the church and so that that plan can be carried out, that plan of disciple-making through the church. And not only that, Paul demonstrated God's wisdom in in the way he lived his life, in the way he conducted himself. He demonstrated God's wisdom not only to everyone that he came in contact with, but to the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul bore witness to God's wisdom that is far beyond Paul's wisdom. Now, Paul was a pretty wise guy. He knew a lot, but he knew that he was in desperate need, not of his own wisdom, but of God's wisdom revealed through him. This last one is one that I'm not comfortable with. Uh, Paul suffered for the good of others. Now, I don't even want to suffer for my own good. I don't even want to wake up in the morning and go to the Y and work out and suffer for my own good. Paul, like Christ, said, you know what? If you are going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, part of that includes suffering. And suffering not for your own good, but suffering for the good of others. We need to remember that as Paul is writing this, he is sitting in a Roman prison. And the reason he is sitting in prison is because he was proclaiming the gospel. And as he proclaimed the gospel, that ended up putting him in hot water with the authorities that were ruling over that land. And what happened is Paul was suffering. But Paul said, you know what? My suffering is for your good, and my suffering is for the glory of God. So my suffering is a good suffering. I am so thankful that I get to suffer for the name of Jesus. Now, many of us, we live in a culture of comfort. We make many of our decisions based on our own comfort. We eat comfort food. And some of us eat more comfort food than we need to. Um, we, we seek our own comfort. We have air conditioning in our house, which is primarily about our own comfort. Now, heat, I think, is a necessity in the, in the state we live in, um, but air conditioning is certainly in our homes for our own comfort. The cruise control in my car on the way up here this morning is there for my own comfort, so I don't have to, just so I don't have to put my foot on the gas. That's not a very hard thing to do. But somebody invented the cruise control so that we could be more comfortable as people. We, as a culture, live for our own comfort. And God calls us to a life of sacrifice and suffering. Christ 
was Paul's example. And Christ was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ suffered that we might have life. And Paul said, if Christ suffered, then I should rejoice in my suffering. So, as I often say, Paul lived a life where he was going to either win or win. And, the, and to kind of unpack that, what I mean by that is that Paul, if he lived, he got to live for Christ. And if he died, he got to be with Christ. And so the people that were after Paul are like, how are we going to make him suffer? Like, if we kill him, he goes to be with his Lord. If we let him live, he's going to talk about this Jesus to us, his prison guards. And that's exactly what he did. Paul viewed every opportunity as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Many of us, if we were thrown in prison, we would go, oh, there goes my ministry, no opportunity to preach. Paul's going, wow, no, this is great, captive audience. No one can leave. This is, this is awesome. So Paul always looked at life with an optimistic, or through an optimistic lens, where he was able to go, okay, if God has me on this uh, journey back to Rome to go to prison, I'm going to use this journey as an opportunity to preach the gospel to the people that I'm closest with. And he took every opportunity he could to preach, even if that included his own suffering. So I do have a question to ask each one of us, myself included. Am I willing to suffer for the name of Jesus? Am I willing to suffer maybe some difficulty on my part for the good of others? Or am I living life with myself at the center and is it about my comfort? Is life about my comfort or is life about God's glory? And I'm working on that. I don't have an answer personally. Um, I'm still working on this. Am I willing to suffer for the sake of Christ that he may be made known in this community and in this world? I struggle. I'll be honest with you. I would, I would love to stand up here and say, you know what, I would, I'm willingly going to suffer for the sake of Christ. But I still have some selfish motives within me that need to be work, worked out. So you could even be praying for me in that way. Lastly, uh, the last large paragraph in this passage talks um, about a prayer that Paul is praying for the Ephesian church. And Paul is praying, first and foremost, that they would know God's inexhaustible riches. A lot of us look at the circumstances of our life, and we measure how we're doing based on what we can see. We live life based on what we can see in our bank account, what we can see in job security, what we can see in the in success of our children or grandchildren. And Paul is saying, you know what? What I want most for the church in Ephesus is that they would understand God's inexhaustible riches. Everything on this earth will fade and fail. But God's inexhaustible riches are inexhaustible. It's, it's, we can't get to the bottom of the barrel because there is no bottom to the barrel with God. He has inexhaustible riches. Everything is his. And if he needs more, he always has access to more. More love, more grace. We can't ever run out of God's good gifts to us. Secondly, uh, that, that they would have strength in their inner being. Now, when we were talking about that suffering issue, it takes internal fortitude to be willing to suffer for someone else. And Paul is praying that they would have God's strength in their inmost being. At the core of who these people are, this church in Ephesus, Paul is hoping that to the guts, to their guts, that they are strengthened. Not a surface strengthening, not something that appears strong, 
but something that is truly strong at its core. He also prayed that they would comprehend the love of Christ. Now, I think that's kind of funny because can we comprehend the love of Christ? There's no way. This past week, I was talking with middle schoolers about icebergs. You know, and and icebergs, you only see the top 10%. 90% of it is below below the waterline. This is very much like God's love. I don't even think we see 10% of God's love. I do not think we can comprehend God's love. But Paul is praying for the Ephesians that they would comprehend God's love. Now, Paul isn't praying this, that they would fully understand all of God's love. He's praying that they would have a hunger for God's love and to understand the depth of God's love. And we only ever understand the depth of God's love when we are desperately in need. When we are desperately in need, all of a sudden we're reaching out to something and someone greater than ourselves and we realize God's love in a brand new way. This goes very much with that idea of suffering. So as we're suffering, we're learning more of God's love. And as we learn more of God's love, that will help us as we step forward, and suffer for the sake of Christ. Uh, Lastly, under this prayer, uh, Paul also hopes that the church in Ephesus, uh, that they would embrace the supremacy of Christ, that they would embrace that Jesus is above everything, that Jesus is all in all. And the reason Paul wants them to grasp this idea that Jesus is all that you ever will need, is he didn't want the church in Ephesus to put their hope in anything but Christ and Christ alone. And if we're honest with ourselves, we put our hope in so many things. Everything other than Christ will fail you. You may say, you know, no, I have a great marriage. My wife loves me or my husband loves me dearly loves me, well, at some point, you'll realize that that will fail. And maybe you've already realized that your spouse's love for you has failed you in some way because we're all human. And we don't need to put our hope in people. We need to put our hope in Christ. And as we put our hope in Christ, we can have this strengthened inner being that allows us to live in a brand new way. And honestly, this life in Christ is not about us. Living in Christ, this whole series, honestly, is not about us. It's about Christ living in us so that we are transformed and changed. This, this life is not about our own wants, our own needs, our own desires. It's all for the glory of God. And God loves each one of us so much that he sent his son so that we might have a right relationship with him, that we might be reconciled back to him. And there's nothing we can do to earn that. But by God's grace, he offers us this right relationship, this reconciling back to God. And as we reconcile back to God, his desire is just like Paul Just like in Paul's life, God desires not only to reconcile us back to himself, but he wants us to be his ambassadors and going going into the community and into the relationships that we're already in with the good news of Jesus Christ. And I love the last couple verses. And you know what? I see a typo up there. It, It says Ephesians 3, 20 through 12. That does not make sense. Um, But as I said, I'm not perfect. Uh, This should read Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. And it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think, according to to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, 
and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Those verses indicate to us that it is God's work working through us, and it's for God that we join his work. I am so excited that God wants to carry his work out through his church. It still doesn't make sense to me, but that's what God shows, and he is a lot wiser than I am. So he is doing his work through his church. So my hope and prayer this week is that we would allow God to do that in and through our lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so very thankful that you've invited us to be recipients of your grace. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone here that has yet to make you their Savior and Lord, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they would come to know you as their Savior. Lord, right now I pray that as you lead us and guide us, that we would realize that it is by your grace that you have enabled us to be your ministers your disciple makers in this area. Lord, I pray that we would realize that you empower us as we go into this community for your good, for your glory, and for the good of all people. And Lord, I pray that we would realize that we need to be prayerfully dependent on you. Lord, our own selfish wants, needs, and desires will get in the way. But Lord, I pray that your glory and your grace would rule and reign in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, that you would enable us not only to be changed by your grace, to but, but to be change agents in this community and in the relationships that you have placed us in. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for Ephesians chapter 3. In Jesus' name, amen.